So for the first time in two weeks, we are back. Got the band back together. Got the band back together. Uh, it was nice to take a little break. I think we should do that every now and then, give each other a little break. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's, it's tough every week doing uh it is and we had some sweet good feeling guests good, yeah good yeah. good uh but we back together again now we're back together yep. back in the game uh i got a lot going on in the garden weather's pretty out there the weather's pretty but i swear there is a it's like a fog out there. there's so much pollen in the air it looks hazy yeah out there. it's that time of year everybody's just sneezing and a coughing and a carrying on yeah now i'm gonna be on up what looked like chewed up butter beans yeah from last week. but i gonna be honest with you that kind of stuff just bounces off me yeah. Been out in it all my life and kind of immune to it. It just bounces tough, straight off me. Yeah. You don't take any flu nah. days or Zyrtec mm -hmm. or nothing? Nah. No needing tough. that. Manly man is what I am. <laughs> okay. I got you. I got you. Um, I want to show some people uh, or show what we got going on with some plants here and talk about some plants. So let me pull these out here. So I have got, I've got taters coming up. Why don't we turn around the other way and pick them seat of a ride, you know? Okay, okay, let's do that. Um, I've got taters coming up. I've got some that are about that tall. Um, they Just got mine planted. The latest, I believe, I have ever planted Ooh, my you taters. you are late. I am late. You are late to But, the I game. mean, I got them in the ground, so. You don't have to be good and dry by now. Yeah. Um, i got taters coming up. i got squash and cucumbers planted. i got lima beans planted. Earlier this week, uh, made a video. I made me a little I've arch that. I've seen that. with my cattle panels. So I got my Christmas lima beans planted. Um, by this weekend, I'm going to have some of my tomatoes and peppers in the ground. These guys ain't quite ready yet. They're real close. Though. They are real close. I got herbs and some flowers in the greenhouse ready to go in the ground. So I, every other day or so, I'm, I've been planting stuff. Uh, I'm still holding off a little bit on my sweet corn because... I'm planting a super sweet, and I want it to warm up just a hair more mm -hmm. um, yep. before I do that. But I wanted to talk about tomato germination real quick and just seed starting, just some general seed starting practices in general. You looking to see if there's any empty cells? No, I was looking. I was going to show people a little, a little tidbit when you get through. Okay. So on our row by row group, we had some people saying, well, I got this one tomato variety from you that germinated real fast, and this other one was slower to come up. And I want to kind of explain some things there. And one thing I have seen, a lot of these people that are posting pictures of their seed trays, I don't know about you, but the soil looks dry to me. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. think they're watering enough. And I understand a lot of people like to bottom water because it's not messy. You can do it inside. And, and some people may disagree with me on this, but until those roots reach the bottom there, until that seed germinates and you get a root that can reach that water reservoir in the bottom, you need to be watering these things over the top. Yeah, now the whole bottom bottom tray thing has kind of got me perplexed just a little bit. The bottom tray is not necessarily meant as a reservoir. It will work that way somewhat, but that's not the best way to use it. The best way to use it is a catch. Is a catch. When you leave that water sitting still in a tray, you're asking for some problems. Some junk can start growing in there. So really and truly, the best way to use it is as a reservoir so it catches your excess water and then you drain it off every now and then. Try not to leave you an inch or two in there and thinking that that's going to wick up. It will, but it's going to cause you some problems. I mean, that's setting yourself up for disease right there. So use your bottom tray as just a simple to catch and keep make, making a mess everywhere. And you water from overhead. And I think you'll be better off disease-wise if you have that practice. The other thing is, so the, the wicking deal. Now this seed starting mix, it, it, it takes, any seed start mix for that matter, takes a lot of water to get it wet initially. And if you put it in here dry, and then expect it to wick all the way up and wet these cells completely. No, that will never it. happen. happen. So you either need to pre-wet it or do like we do and put it in there and soak it down good before you plant. It's not going to, I don't care how good the wicking is, this stuff just soaks up too much water. And what it ends up happening is your cells are too dry there. We water these things two to three times a day to the extent that water drips out the bottom of them. Um, 
Yeah, especially when you're having, when you're germinating seed, it's, it's hard to keep them too wet until that seed pops through. Now, when the seed pops through and your plants start coming up, I back off just a hair. A hair means just a little bit. But when you're trying to germinate them seeds, man, you got to keep that top layer wet. Not the bottom layer, but the top layer wet. And so some people had some issues with, it seemed like their pelleted seeds weren't germinated as well as their non-pelleted seeds. And, and the, the common uh, denominator there that I saw was that they weren't watering it enough. And you got to think that pelleted seed, that's a seed that's coated in clay. Mm, and you got to break that clay off you of it. you got to break that clay off there. Now, the reason they pellet seeds are because they're so much easier to singulate in the trays. But you got to break that pellet off there. And if you're counting on just some wick in there, you're never going to dissolve that pellet. So if you're planting pelleted seeds especially, you need to be flushing some water through here, dissolve that pellet. Now, the way we do it, I find that the pelleted seeds usually germinate faster than the other ones. I but too. for some of these people that are not flushing the water through there, they may have the opposite thing. So if you're doing pelleted seeds, you definitely need to be giving them some water. Well, the I top. say pelleted or not, but I can definitely see where the pelleted seed would be a lot slower if you're trying to weak it through the bottom. Um, but, but as far as our row by row group on Facebook goes, when people post a picture there, some issues they're having, I'd say almost 75% of the time I can look at that and say that that seed mix is, is just too dry. So a lot of people ask, when's the plant ready? Now that baby right there is getting, I just pulled it out and it's getting real close to being ready. I wish you could get a close up. It needs to be thin. Don't yeah, it? look at them roots in there. And I'm going to talk about that thin in just a second. Because somebody I'm not going to mention is pretty bad about planting two seeds per pod and not coming back thin and out. Now you see what happens there when you get two seeds in there. When them babies come straight out of the pot soil, I take my knife and I go up there and I thin them out because that's right there is what you don't want. Now the way I don't I, use their knife, I just uh Yep, and that's your problem. When you pull like that, you're gonna a lot of times bust your root system up. Take your little pair of scissors, because you don't want to disturb that root system, or your good sharp knife, reach in there like that right there and just clip it right off. Look at her. Uh, my old knife done got dull on me. How about that? Very good uh, mm. There we go. demonstration. Now, see there, I didn't disturb that root system whatsoever like you was going to do. And that thing's going to die off and you got one good plant there. You don't want two plants per sale. That's just asking for troubles right there and we don't want no troubles. Uh, you know, it's hard to get one seed in there. It's pellet to seed that's a lot easier, but then raw tomato seeds, it's hard to get one seed in there. And it's okay if you get two or three in there, but when they come up, make sure you thin them out. Are you saying I forgot to do I'm that? I'm telling you, you forgot to do it. I did it for a bunch of them on you, and uh, I missed one or two of them there, but I got tired of doing it for you. I said, oh, boy, these learners lesson the hard way. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I just, I, I, I'm on here once a week, so I, I just kind of plant stuff and... Uh, you leave it, old pod, take care of it. Leave it to you to, to procure it. Okay, look, look at there. And I just pulled out straight out. Now, I'm going to tell you. That was ready to go. That was ready to go. Right we had there. a little something on them first leaves there, but... Yeah, some disease issues going on there. A little bit of stuntedness, stuntedness too. We had some cold weather and they didn't grow out. They might not have got some fertility right when they needed it. They'll do that sometimes. There's another one pulled out. I now you can let these be all right once we put them in the ground. Yeah, man. you let those babies dry out just a hair and harden off, and you can plant you some tomatoes right there. Yeah, and that's why. So I got a video I did last year on uh, healing tomatoes, and people said, "Well, I just plant mine real deep." To heal them, but when you're working with a transplant like this, you can't plant it but a couple inches yeah. deep, and we wait that it comes up, and then we heal it. And throw some You'll see there's some missing out of here. I planted some of these. This is red snapper right here. I I pulled these out and planted them Saturday. I planted me three red snappers because I wanted to try them in my row there, and I planted me some lemon boy and butter boy, and I planted them at, at this stage right here. And you're right, I couldn't I couldn't bury them very deep, but I did get them at about right. But you, you'll be throwing some dirt to them once they oh, come Oh, yeah, up. yeah, yeah. Heck yeah. So anyway, make sure you give your seed trays plenty of water. <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> what else we got going on? Um, stock update. I'll let you give a little stock update as far as what's going on with the Man. manufacturing side of things. Because I get, I get, I reply to Facebook comments uh, every day about 
people won't know when we're going to have something in stock yeah. and all this. And I We know. had a lady call the other day, and I heard her ask one of the customer service girls if we was going out of business. And I just overheard a conversation, and she was trying to explain to her that, no, we're a nice, healthy company, we're doing fine. But the lady was under the impression we was having some problems because we didn't have nothing in inventory. And then I hollered at her. I said, well, I'm thinking seriously about it. But I was just, it was all in jest. <laughs> we are having a lot of issues with stock. Uh, we tried to prepare the best we could. And in hindsight, I should have done some things differently. We have been pushed back on manufacturing worse than it was last year. Uh, we've seen some major, major delays. Some of our vendors that would normally push us out eight weeks has pushed us out 16 weeks. We're having some further delays in that. I mean, there's polymer shortages. There's all kind of shortages out there. And green ladies, paint. Green paint. We couldn't get paint the other day. Supposed to be in today. We had parts ready to paint. We've never had trouble getting paint. Couldn't get paint. So we worked some magic and they're supposed to be getting it in this week. So, uh, I mean, parts. We're having trouble getting parts. Um, we even ordered a machine to sweep the floor in the warehouse. And you know, it's been two months and we still can't get it. Mm. I mean, just simple things. So that, it takes a long time to hand sweep 20,000 square feet. It does, right? and people's getting tired of it, and I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we're we doing the best we can. We, we're having some issues, and everybody else is having some issues. And I told somebody this other day, and I'll tell all you folks out there, because y'all may not be in the same situation where we are, where we see. And I'll tell you another thing. We got some shipments coming in from overseas. We got some uh, some bags and stuff coming from overseas. Off of the port, or they ships are circling around there in the ocean because they can't get into the port. Ports are working at about 50% capacity, and they can't get the ships unloaded. So we just got ships sitting off our air circling around that can't get in there. Hanging around fishing, probably. I don't know about that, but they just sitting around there enjoying the sunset. All kind of delays all over the spectrum. And I will tell you people this, just like I told some other day. If you see something on our website that you think you may want, and it's in stock, you better get it because I'm making no guarantees about next week because I don't know. And furthermore, if you think there's a bicycle, a camper, or a boat, or anything like that that you may want and you find it for sale, you better get it. You better get it because I can tell you it's going to get worse before it gets better. All kind of delays through manufacturing all the way down to little bitty just plastic parts. All kind of delays, and it takes one little part to stop the manufacturing of a big product. So these shortages everywhere. So anything that you think you may want to need for the next six months and you see an opportunity to get it, you better get it. I happen to know a fella in the boat business, uh, my wife's stepdad, and uh, I've been talking to him, and he said, man, he could have done sold a bazillion can't get boats them. this year. Can't get them. And can't get them. Last year when we bought our, um, we bought a pop-up camper in, uh, was it June or July or so, and, uh, bought it used and i said we got a camper well we got to get us some bicycles ride bicycles camping and i was had a hard i had to look and look to find bicycles a darn lot, bicycle a lot of places was a out bicycle. bicycles yeah. uh yeah. yeah anything outdoors related camper boat uh garden gardening uh, it's it's in high demand right now and if you see something you like yeah you best get it we've had trouble getting boxes in Boxes of all things, we had major issues getting boxes in, bags, any just just stupid stuff that you take for granted. We're having trouble sourcing getting in. Yeah, it's just a state of what we live in right now. And uh, bear with us. We're doing the best we can. It's nothing we're doing intentionally. And we actually thought we planned pretty good for this. And uh, in hindsight, we're going to be doing some things different in the coming years. I can promise you that. We're evaluating all our vendors to make sure they can handle handle what we give them because a lot of our vendors are not going to handle our orders so we're going to in the future going to be evaluating you know do we need to stay with this vendor or do we need to switch to another vendor right yeah and i can promise you we wish the things was in stock just as bad as you do Ooh, it hurts me when you want to give me some money and i can't take it, it <laughs> hurts me in a bad way <coughs> um i want to go over something real quick i mentioned this on my last greenhouse video i did so last year we did this uh giant sunflower growing competition and overwhelming response um us and some other youtubers got involved with it and then all customers kind of jumped in and it, we just had a, a good big time with it 
This year, instead of doing sunflowers, we decided to do giant pumpkins. So hmm. I'm working closely with uh, my buddy Aaron over at the Four Kids in a Farm. So it's Four Kids in a Farm on YouTube and on Instagram. We'll put some links to their page below. So working with him, I'm putting together this giant pumpkin growing contest. And I'm not sure if he's made an announcement yet, but I want to go ahead and make an announcement. And I'm sure he'll make an announcement on his channel and just kind of clarify and set out the rules. Because it's time, I just started mine the greenhouse last week. It's time to get them going. We're going to do this competition in the spring because I feel like that gives everybody the most fair shot growing a big pumpkin. Some people are climatically challenged and it's hard to grow pumpkins in the fall. Especially big ones, they'll, they'll explode on you. They will explode on you. Um, so we're going to do it in the spring, and uh, we're going to have give everybody plenty of time, even the people up north who may not be planting until May or so. So this is, I'm going to kind of go over some ground rules here. Rule number one, you got to grow one of our giant varieties. You can't be going to some old boy on eBay that's got a, a, a private stock of uh, county fair winning seeds because that wouldn't be fair to everybody. So it's gotta be one of our four giant varieties. I've got three in stock on the website now. I got one I'll be restocking, I think later this month, called Prize Winner. But we've got the Mammoth Gold there. We've got Big Max, and we've got Atlantic Giant. Got those three in stock. Prize Winner will be restocked later this month here. So I, play, I started some Big Macs and Atlantic Giant, and I was just going to kind of pick which transplants I looked the be that looked the best. And uh, I've grown that Atlantic, Atlantic Giant, I think, before. So you got to grow one of our four varieties, okay? And this is going to be the fun part, because Aaron asked me this. He's like, well, how am I, if I grow a 100-pound, 200-pound pumpkin, how am I going to get that thing to a scale and weigh it. And I said, well, I think that would be kind of the fun part. I don't have a forklift at my house. I'm going to have to get creative if I grow a big one. So to officially post your pumpkin or, you know, how big a pumpkin you grew, you got to post a picture on social media, whether it be Facebook or Instagram. You need a picture of that pumpkin on the scale so we can see the weight and need a little card there that says what variety it is. Okay? Yeah. Now, we're a long ways off from weighing um and we so right now we're just going to do the biggest pumpkin we may end up refining it down the line to the biggest per variety we'll when you just, say biggest you mean the heaviest the right? heaviest okay. the heaviest we're not going to measure them the heaviest pumpkin so you got to take a picture of it on a scale there and post that on social media and when you post it on social media you can tag us and we we would love for you to tag us but specifically you got to tag aaron's Facebook page or his Instagram page, Four Kids in a Farm. He's going to keep track of all the results. You know, in hindsight, you should have done biggest. It would have been easier on people. What, to measure it? To measure it. Yeah, I, I want to see pictures of it sitting on a scale. You want some weight to it, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I want to see pictures. You of want to see them after they done picked it up and hauled it out of the garden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so don't break your back. Borrow your buddy's tractor if you have to. Um we're going to use the hashtag. Last year, we used the hashtag Sunflower Showdown when we were posting pictures of sunflowers. This year, we're going to use the hashtag Hoss Pumpkin Boss. So one word, Hoss Pumpkin Boss. If you post a picture of your giant pumpkins that you're growing for the competition or whatever, use that hashtag and tag specifically Aaron, uh, his channel, Four Kids at a Farm. You can tag us as well. The winner is going to get a $200 gift certificate. $200? $200. Well, who made this executive decision? $200 gift certificate to Hoss Tools. The Ooh. winner, the one who has the biggest pumpkin. We yeah. may figure out some uh, side prizes for the biggest per variety. Some kind of... $200? Uh, Couldn't get by with 25 or so? No, no. We got to up the ante for this. It, somebody grows a 200-pound pumpkin, they, they, they deserve it. That's a dollar a pound. Um, so get your giant pumpkin seeds. This is going to be fun for everybody. And, uh, if everybody uses the hashtag Hoss Pumpkin Boss, then you can go on Facebook or Instagram mm -hmm. and search that hashtag. And then you can see everybody's, um, pictures of them growing, weighing in, and, uh, it should be a lot of fun. Yeah. I got a little experience and I'll give y'all just a tidbit of a tip on this one right here. Cause I have a little bit of experience with them giant pumpkins. 
low and slow. You can't stress that plant it whatsoever and you can't overwater it and you can't over fertilize it. You have to just gradually feed it nearly every day what it needs and you'll be okay. But if you stress it whatsoever, you're gonna have some plosion issues. And and you got you, you got to cull them, don't you? you got to cull them. You got to get you got to get your. And it ain't no too. fun when you have plosion issues because you got uh -uh. you a big old watermelon, and you I mean a watermelon. You got you a big old pumpkin, and you're so proud of it. You, you named your you named mine, and you walk out one day, you're gonna show it to your neighbor, and it has ploded on you. Mm. Mm -mm. You just sit there and squall, ploded pumpkin. They explode, or sometimes the rear end fall out of it. Mm -hmm. Ploded. Mm. Anyway, so every, right now for us is the time to be starting. Uh, I would recommend transplanting these giant ones, uh, but everybody might want to do a little different. But get you a pack of those. Um, if you don't have drip irrigation to put on, get you an old IV bag. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Get you an old IV bag that's got a little thing on everybody's got those laying around. Everybody's got those laying around. If it, go out to the dumpster, get you an old IV bag, and put your little small drip on that plant. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. I've seen that done before. Maybe put a little morphine in there. Morphine too. in there, yeah. And antibiotics. <laughs> All right. Um, new variety time. New variety time. Um, a corn I have been talking about and promising for a while. We added some of those augmented super sweets. Uh, the Yellowstone's the one I'm growing, the all yellow one. We just got this one in. This is the bicolor version. So these are the ones that have the super sweet plus the tender sugary enhanced kernels on them uh, for the gal that ain't got a whole just lot Just well be growing sugar in my opinion. Uh, good stuff right here. So Nirvana is the, um, the bicolor version of that. Just added that to the site. This one here I have going in some seed trays. I'm excited about this one. This is a kind of a kabocha type squash. We had a variety of kabocha called high kabocha that got discontinued and I was looking at adding one. This is a C maxima variety uh, species and this one's called speckled hound. So it kind of looks like the porcelain doll but with some green coloration on it. So it's supposed to be good for eating, right? Real good for eating. Really? And the maximus means it's going to spread on you just a little bit, right? Well, they, the they, they're all kind of crawled. Yeah, but it's bit. more so than the pepo. The pepo is more of a compacter plant than this. Right, is. yeah, yeah. Uh, so speckled hound, I got some of those started in the greenhouse now. This last one I'm, I'm really excited about, especially with my arch trellis. So I can rotate this in there on it. So a lot of people have been asking, they say they don't have room to grow cantaloupes or watermelons on the ground. Can they trellis a watermelon? And I say, well, I ain't. I've seen it done. People have to make them a sling with pantyhose and stuff. Yeah. But this one right here, so this is a, a cantaloupe or melon variety that only gets one pound. It makes these little mini one pound melons. And supposedly these are highly sought after in the culinary industry. They almost have a kind of a tropical flavor to them. So these only get one pound. So if you do want to, if you limit in space and need to grow some melons vertically, mm -hmm. I believe you could get by with growing these on a cattle panel since they're only one pound. You may have to train them a little bit that's interesting. So tasty bites. That's your, your tasty bite, one pound cantaloupe right there. I'm not a cantaloupe fan or I'd be growing some. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan. My youngins eat them. Uh, you got youngins? I, I may just grow them just to be growing them. Yeah. Miss Hoss likes them, but I'm just not a fan. It's hard for me to grow something that I don't like. Put a lot of effort into it if I'm not going to eat it. I'm a little, a little bit selfish on that point, I guess. You, you know what You know what gets my goat people putting salt on watermelon? Ooh, I hate that. Mm. I do too. That's, I've seen it done. I just cringe. That's, it's, that's a little more than misdemeanor to me. Yeah, your mama do it in a heartbeat. All right, today we're going to be talking about field peas. So uh, me and Fredo talked a little bit about field peas last week, and... We had a lot of people asking, what's the difference between English peas and field peas? I know for a lot of you, this is this is not going to be new news. A lot of y'all grow field peas all the time. But a lot of you probably don't know anything about field peas. I think field peas is more of a southern thing, don't you? It is, but I don't really know why. It's not like they have a long growing season. I think you could pretty much grow them up north. Yeah. Uh I don't know why they're not as popular up there. If it's a taste thing, 
Uh, you know, okra's not as popular up north. No. They don't seem to like it as Boy, we love peas down here in the south. Yeah. I don't know why it's it's not as popular. Because up there, when they say peas, they talk about English peas. They don't. A lot of them don't, don't grow field peas. But uh, field peas around here, you go to any kind of little local event, carnival or anything like that, there's allowed to be a truck out there selling bags of field peas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a little event several years ago. You remember that, the farmer's market? And there was a truck over there. And they was, I ain't never seen, they was selling them like, Mm -hmm. Hotcakes, yep. big old bags of zipper peas. Right. So field peas, aka cow peas. Uh, you also see them called southern peas. Although they they like heat, but I guess they call it southern peas because they're popular down here. You know, people up north are dry, so they used to go into the grocery store and buying the black eyed peas, right? And, yeah, and dried black eyed peas, or the other dried peas. Black eyes is the most popular one where you soak them overnight and you cook them. That's the same top pea we're talking about, but we eat them fresh a lot, or either we put them in the freezer. We don't can them. No, we freeze them. We freeze them, but... Yeah. So field peas actually originated in Africa. Really? And they're, they, where they originated from and what they're bred to tolerate is hot, humid conditions, and they're one of the things that can grow pretty well in sandy soils that don't have a lot of nutrients. Mm -hmm. So that's it's a why poor man's crop. They they grow well in Africa, and they they initially were cultivated to feed livestock. Mm -hmm. And that might be why some people don't like them because they think it's just livestock feed. But we find them pretty tasty. Um, so field pea, we're talking about the species Vigna unguiculata. I think that's how you say that. Ooh. Ooh, that was heavy, what you put on me just saying. Yeah. So look, for, before we dig into field peas real hardcore here, let's talk about the difference between English peas and field peas. So when we say English peas, we're talking about your green round peas, mm -hmm. which is a more of a cool weather crop. Mm -hmm. Now, if you live somewhere that has moderate summers, you can grow it during the summer, but English peas don't like it real hot. People go to the grocery store and they buy them English peas in a can. Some people call them sewer peas. Little sewer peas. Little sewer yeah. peas. Yep. Like sewer peas. They, 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 they taste horrible to me. I, I don't like them out of a can. Love them out of the garden, but don't like them out of a can. But you know, a lot of people buy them out of a can and cook them. Yeah. But that's your classic English pea. Yeah. Your little green pods that get about that long. You shell them. Round green peas. You can eat them raw. They're good raw. You yeah. can cook them. You can freeze them. That's your English pea. Around here, we plant them in the fall or in the early spring. They don't like the heat. Now, your field peas, well, and another thing, English peas, you want to trellis your English peas. Field peas, on the other hand, love the heat. You want to wait till it gets good and hot to plant your field peas. And field peas, you're going to wait to harvest them. You could let them dry out completely like you do with black-eyed peas, but you want to wait and harvest them when that pod turns a little bit. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little more. Field peas, for the most part, there are a few varieties that will climb. We'll go over those, but for the most part, you're not trellising those. So English peas is cool weather. Field peas, hot weather. English peas, you trellis. Field peas, for the most part, you don't. English peas have a sweeter flavor to them. Field peas kind of have a little more nuttier flavor to them. You got to put a little fat back or something in, in them field peas to season them up when you cook them. A little you know, bacon grease. Bacon fat, fat back. back and I tell you what. Ham bones. And, and once once you, you divvy some out on your plate, if you take you some fresh onion. Mm -hmm. and uh, Yeah, well, I love that. little pieces of diced fresh onion on there. Shh, mm -hmm. Shut your mouth. Mm -hmm. So let's go just through some terminology here because um, there's a lot of, it's kind of like okra. There's a lot of old varieties and old terminology used out there and sometimes people get it crossed up. Yeah, and i tell you something else. You know, here in the South, everybody's got their favorite field, field pea, pea and they are hung up on that. They are more reliant or more, oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? They want that particular one, they don't care enough about nothing else, whether it be yeah. a zipper, whether it be a uh, purple hull, or a cream 40 or whatever it be, that's the one that they're not willing to, to try something new. They want that same one yeah, year after year. You try to offer year. them a substitute. Nope, nope, nope. I want them right there. I want them zippers. Or that's the only cream ones I like. That's, yep. the only, yep. that's the only ones that's fitting to eat, they'll say. Yep. And, uh, you know, folks get stubborn about the field peas. Now. Worse, I think, field peas. Corn may be next, but field yeah. peas is by far the worst one to get hung up on, a variety. Yeah. 
I, I get tickled when people say about corn. They'll say, I, I only grow silver queen. That other stuff ain't fit to eat. No, good and well. The, the autumn corn, I ain't never seen an ear of sweet corn I didn't like. No, that's kind of like horses to me. I ain't never seen an ugly horse. They all good. Now, some better than others, but they, they, they all But some stuff. folks will swear it ain't fit to eat. They, they must have more advanced taste buds than I got. Yeah, well, uh, they might have gotten a hold of some bad corn out of the grocery store or something other. I have. So um, when we talk about field peas, you'll hear the term purple hole mentioned a lot. And what does that mean? That means when them peas start to get ready to, to pick and when that pod's going to be easier to shell, that pod will turn purple. Just like the name says, it's a purple hull. And man, we have grown purple hulls around here forever. Yeah. Now I had a, a, a customer uh, a year or two ago called, they ordered some of our Mississippi purple hulls and they were upset because it was a brown pea. But somebody had told them that all purple hulls was a green piece. And they're not. No, you could have a brown purple hole and a green pur purple hole just means what's kind of the color of the outside pot is. And I had to uh, give said customer a little education. Lesson, a little education on the field piece. So purple, when you hear that term purple hole, it's not exclusive to a variety. There, we have Mississippi purple hole. We have a um, top pick, which is a purple hole. Lots of different purple holes out there. Um, I do find that the purple holes are a little less susceptible to getting stung up as bad than something like the zippers. The pods, the, the shell's a little thicker. Really? Um, hmm. Or maybe it's just because you, maybe since it's purple, you can't see that they That may be what bad. it is. So let's go through the types here. Um, now that we've made the distinction that purple hole does not mean it's a certain type. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you these, and we might bust open a few of these to show people what they look like. Some of these I haven't got on the site yet, but I probably will by the time this show ends. Ooh, peas, we got a little shipment in, and they selling like hot cakes. Yeah, uh, I hear the zippers, we, the pounds of those is going fast. Mm. So let's start off with what we call Crowder peas. So we got Crowder peas, we got cream peas, and we got black eyed peas. That's the three distinctions I'm going to kind of make. We could get more complicated with it if you want to. So your Crowder peas is your dark pea. That one's going to have a little more nuttier flavor. Bust open that, uh, whichever one you want to there. The Dixie Lee, we'll separate the black eye. Bust open one of those. Let me show them what a Crowder pea looks like. A lot of people like Crowder peas. I like all peas. So if you see yep. there, see how brown so they are? Crowder peas is going to be a brown, darker pea. It's going to have a little bit of a more nuttier flavor. Um, then you say you, you cream pea. Mm -hmm. So your Crowders, you got your Dixie Lee, you got your Mississippi Purple Hole. That's why I was saying a Purple Hole can be a Crowder or a cream pea. Um, and then we got one we're going to be adding soon. I just got to get it on the site. Maybe on there by the time it's the show air. It's called Red Ripper. Now we used to grow these. <laughs> uh, we didn't know what they were. Somebody told us, and this, this happens a lot with seed, and that's why when somebody says, I got an old heirloom variety my grandma saved, I say, well, can you get me a name for it? I want to see if it actually is something unique. We had some of these Red Rippers. We didn't know what they were, and we thought we had something special. Come to find out, this is a pretty common Yeah, I, and we did a video on that way back in the day. They we was were saving them like they was that, gold. Gold, yeah. We saved them. Uh, uh, Granny and Jean Paul saved them for years. Man, we just thought we had some special thing here. Did a video on there, and they are really good pea and very prolific. Now, I will tell you about these right here. This is a running pea right here. Yeah, you need to put them on a trellis. And trellis, and another thing too, if you've ever thought you wanted to plant a variety for livestock, for a cover crop, this red, red ripper here is the one for that. Boy, your goats and stuff will just absolutely love it. It's very resilient. It's an easy pea to grow. It'll first, make during the heat of summer. Yeah, if you're a first time uh, pea grower, this may be the one for you. Red Ripper, it's a great one. You know, harvest what you want, and then you can turn your animals in there, the goats in there to finish them off. That's a good one right there. They takes plenty of room for them. Don't crowd them in there on no 30 inch rows. You if probably you need at least four foot row spacing on these right here. If you want to make your little arch like I did, that would be perfect for it. Climb all over it. Now, we'll, you know, we were talking about people not liking, they got the pea they like. 
I, me and my wife thought these were delicious. We yeah, put I up did a bunch too. of them. Momo, who's getting on up to be about 95, she said they wouldn't fit in to eat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so everybody's got their own, uh, they're, they're, I don't. I like all peas, but some people are just particular. But that Red Ripper, so we'll sell that in packets. But that also makes a really good cover crop. So if you want to grow something like an iron clay pea, which ain't really fit to eat, and you want to go out there and harvest them, and the vining nature of this, if you grow as a cover crop, you don't need to give it a trellis, obviously. The vining nature is going to give you a lot more ground cover. And you could go out there and pick you some peas before you incorporate it in. So yeah. we're going to carry that that as a cover crop and as a food crop. It's a good eating pea. Freeze is real good too. Yep. So those are our crowders, your darker peas. And then we got our cream peas. And, and these are, there's a lot of different ones of these. We got the Texas big boy pea. You got your top pick pink eye. When they say top pick, uh, for those of you who don't know, that means that the pods all kind of set on top of the plant there. And for the most part, field peas do have pods. It's not like butter beans where they weigh down in there. Yeah, but this was particularly bred to be easy to pick right here. This top pick right here, we grew it a few years ago down at the expo. I'm going to tell you, that is a good one. It just loads up on top. They you saw it up there. You don't have to dig down through the vine for them. They, they're probably the easiest pea that I've seen to pick to harvest. It's a nice, uh, I believe you cook this one right here, it makes a clear broth. Is that right? I believe it does. Oh, man. It, 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 yeah. it, it, it good. makes me happy is yeah. what it makes. Makes you happy? Yeah. That's a good one there. I, you know, if I had a favorite, now I know everybody's got the favorites, and I'm fixing to jump on that bandwagon too, because zippers, everybody is crazy about zippers, because zippers are easy to shell. But if I had to grow just one, this would be it right here for me. Yeah. Right here. Um, another good cream pea, we got the White Acre, that's popular. Um, got the Texas Cream 40, which is a little bigger one, kind of like the uh, Big Boy. Um, we got the Lady Cream, also known as Lady Finger Pea. Fredo said this was, was his favorite. Now, this is a little bit on hard to shell, but there it's a small pea, ain't it? Yep. Yep. Now, I tell you, the hardest one to shell to me, but man, they are good. These sedans, so they, yeah, they, they, little bit now they tiny little peas. They are hard to shell, but they are fine, mm -hmm. fine to eat. And then, uh, then we got the zipper. I I really like the zippers. I think they are absolutely delicious. They seem to be a little more susceptible to, to bug pressure, from from my experiences. But they are extremely, extremely tasty and well known because they're easy to shell by hand. Yeah, yeah. Big round mm -hmm. peas. Uh, most of these have kind of a uh, bean shaped pea, and these are, are more round. So, lots of good options there. I, I don't, I'd have to say, I like the zippers, but if I was to pick one besides the zippers, um, I, I think these, uh, I, I like these wide acres here. I'm gonna Dude. grow either the wide acre or maybe the big boy, I think. So, those are your cream peas, and then you got your black eyed peas here. Uh, black eyed peas is one that most people let dry on the vine and then you put them in a jar or whatever. And uh, We always eat them at New Year's. Always eat them at New Year's. So uh, we got, uh, we had a variety last year called Queen Anne, which had a crop failure we couldn't get. So we added this variety, the California black eye, and uh, we got that one. That's a good one there. Uh, if you're going to let them dry, you got to be on top of your pest pressure a little bit more because you letting them sit out there a little longer. Yeah, but you can let those dry. You can put those in a jar. Yeah. Keep them for a long period of time. Right. That pollen working on you, ain't it? It is. It Bounce is. right been, off of it's me. It's been working on me for a while. So lots of good field pea options. And there's more out there than was what we got here. That's all we can get our hands on. But there's all kind of different names of ones out there people talk about. And you can let us know in the comments below which ones are your favorites. Let's go through some growing conditions real quick. Um, they tolerate sandy soils. That's why a lot of people grow them down here. Even these folks that have just farmed the fire out of their garden and the soil just ain't got nothing in it hardly. They just ain't rotated and they've just farmed it, farmed it, farmed it. They can still grow field peas. Yep. Um, you're gonna need 65 degrees for germination on these. That's why we wait till later. So you need hotter soil even for some of these super sweet corns for field peas. So you want, you're going to, at least down here, you're going to want to wait to middle, early, middle April to plant your field peas. 
And because they, it's not like something where you got to worry about getting it in before the heat gets it. They can take it, so you ain't got to be in a big hurry getting these in. One of the later things I'll plant. I always plant my beans before I do my peas. Yep, me too. Um, these can take some slightly acidic soil. I did read one thing that said it could take down to four and five, but um, the general consensus was somewhere between six and 6.5 on the pH. Yeah. You for sure can't grow these in an the alkaline soil. That would be seven or above, would you say? I would say, I would say if you above 6.5, I, I don't know that I'd uh, try it. I don't know that I'd try it. You want some good acidic soil for these peas. Most of these, in fact, all of these with the exception of the Red Ripper are gonna have a bush growing habit. They're gonna get about 36 inches tall or so, but they're gonna kind of spread out a little bit. Uh, and you can, you know, you can get by on planting most of these varieties on 36 inches. It's gonna be a little tight in there, but you know, it'll, it'll work on 36 inches with the exception of the Red Ripper. Yep. Um, so the Red Ripper is the one vining cultivar we got. And, and that saves you some space. Yeah. You know, if you didn't want to grow them vertically. As far as planting these in the row, you got to plant these things thick. It ain't, it, this is peas in general. You ain't never going to find a pea that's got 95% germination. You plant them thick exist. and you come back and The federal out. germination standards are lower for peas because that's what, you can sell legally peas that have, I think, 65% germination because it's widely accepted that they just don't germ as well. Most of these are going to say anywhere from 75 to 80 percent. That's just peas. That's just what it is. And i tell you something else. Peas are not a good seed to hold over from year to year either. So whatever you buy, you want to use up. You don't want to lay them out and think you're going to save them from next year. And I'm going to tell you that Red Ripper right there has got an 85 percent germination. That's the best one. Most of these are 75 to 80. Yeah. That's just field peas. Yeah. Use up what you don't buy no more than what you're going to need and use up what you buy and next year buy you some most seeds. So plant them thick. If you're using a cedar like our cedar, drill you a couple extra holes in that plate. I like to plant them two, three inches apart. Plant them thick. You can always come back and thin them yep. later, but you got to account for the fact that every one of them seeds ain't going to germinate. Um, I like to plant mine on double rows just like the farmers around here plant peanuts. So I put a row of drip tape and I plant on about a couple inches to each side of it, and then they spread out each way that way. How far apart do you put your double rows? Um, I have four or five feet. Okay. So you still averaging more than what you put on thirty-six inch space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. You you can you can double up there a little bit. Yeah. So that's the way I like to do it. If you have a lot of weed pressure, you may want to go down that road. You may want to do the single row plant if you have a lot of weed pressure. If you don't, you can definitely get by with the double row. Yeah. Um, fertility. These things don't need a lot of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. We talked about you can grow them in pretty sorry, sandy soils. Um, One thing you have to be careful about, and everybody, you know, if you got corn out there and you got your peas close by, you got to treat them different because that... P is not going to take near the amount of nitrogen or phosphorus that that corn is going to take. That's right. Uh, as far as field peas go, I would give them some inoculant. Uh, I would put that down at planting, and I would put this is what I did with my beans the other day. Sprinkle that granular inoculant in there, and maybe sprinkle some of that complete organic fertilizer. And unless they just started looking sorry and terrible, I, I don't know that I'd mess with them beyond that. Not a whole lot. Uh, now, the inoculant thing is if you have grown peas in that soil in the last few years, you probably have that beneficial bacteria in the soil. But I'm going to tell you what, as cheap as inoculant is, it doesn't hurt to sprinkle a little in there. It's like a little insurance policy. Yeah. Put it in there. It's not always needed, but you ain't going to hurt nothing if you, if you got it and you don't need it and you still sprinkle it in there. That's right. So you don't want to give these things too much nitrogen. Make sure they got the bacteria present or the inoculant so they can fix their own nitrogen. But you know what? I also, uh, somebody told me about a study that was done the other day about field peas with inoculated and uninoculated and said that actually they documented some some difference in yields between the inoculated and the uninoculated. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And I've always been of the opinion that only thing it was nitrogen. But they actually pointed me toward this research where they had actually seen where it did make a difference on the yields. I thought that was very interesting. I've read that with beans and stuff that, that you get better yields. Yeah. Um, harvesting. So most of these, with the exception of the black eyes, 
um, you're going to harvest when the pods will start to turn. So the pods start out green, and then for the purple holes, they'll turn purple. You harvest them then. Uh, for the zippers, they turn kind of a pale yellow mm -hmm. when they're ready to harvest. You can see, well, them pods are full of peas. They about to bust at the seams, and um, that's when you want to pick them when they're easy to shell. Yep. Now, what we do, and I would highly recommend this, is I kind of make a deal. So I grow the peas, and when the peas is ready to harvest, then I have laid the rest of it off on her. So what Miss Hoss does is she'll gather the peas, because I'm not the best at pea picking. I'll lose interest pretty quick. You know what I'm saying? I have to go to the store, post office, or somewhere, flat tire, something's happened. Those mm -hmm. chickens is out. I have to leave. <laughs> she up. does the picking, and she does the shelling. Now, she'll put her on one of them soap operas, and she'll sit down there, and she'll shell, shell. Now, I ain't saying I don't every now and then, but for the most part, I don't do any shelling or picking. I kind of contract that out to her. And I take care of all the rules. Now, I don't ask her to get up there and do no weeding, and I don't ask her to get up there and help me plant them or do any of that. I take care of all that. But when it comes gathering time, I let her take over at that point. She does so much better than I do, and that's just kind of the way we work. I would highly recommend you trying to work out a similar situation with your farm or home place. Do you need a contract for that, or is that just You a do need to have some pretty in-depth uh discussions about it because memory lapse will occur sometimes when memory they say lapse. i don't know the last thing you want to do is grow you a bunch of peas and you ain't got the sec the the back end of the work right right, right right and memory loss will occur sometimes i don't remember you telling me that and I, you said you was going to help me and all this so you do need to have it all worked out the details but that works out pretty good if you can work a, a similar situation like that out i got you I don't mind doing the, uh, I don't mind helping out a little bit with the shell. I like to do all the picking myself because I, I got, I, I know what size I like to pick them or whatever. I don't mind helping as, out. As they say, you may be a little asinine about that. Maybe. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't mind helping out with the shell. And now my wife will do all the actual freezing part, the, the blanching and the freezing. Um, when you're picking these peas, it's a lot like picking uh, bush beans to me. Your first picking's just going to be all right. It's that second and third picking where you can really, really knock it out of the park. Yeah. And they ain't going to last a long time. I mean, by the time that third picking, you pretty much through. You got to be careful with these, that, considering you're going to be picking them in the warmer months. After you pick them, you, you, you got to shell them pretty quick. Uh, we what, shell them at, oh, say, happened, we, 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 they get shelled that night around here. If you pick a bunch of these and put them in a bucket and they get too hot, they go in the heat almost like a mm -hmm. compost wheel. They sure will. And they'll burn on you. They will. So if when you pick them, you want, what we do is we spread them out on the floor and put a fan on them if it's going to be very long. You want to keep them cooled off. The big girls, they put them in mesh sacks. Mm -hmm. We used to lay them out even like that. Butter beans the same way. Better keep some air movement on them. They get hot. They'll get hot. I've had seen them get so hot they smoked. Yep. <laughs> um... So you eat, how do you eat these things? Well, you just, you boil them fresh, uh, good like that, or you can freeze them. Uh, some folks will can them. I don't really care for them canned. I don't either. I like to just blanch them and freeze them. Now I tell you, this is what I ain't never heard of before, but they swear by it. A buddy of mine, uh, his wife's mama, you know, old Lynn Thompson lives mm -hmm. down the room from me. I think his wife does this. And I've heard a couple people say this. They say you don't blanch them or do anything with them. You just shell them and you put them in a pillar case and put them in the freezer and they stay good. The pillar case keeps them dry and then you just go get out what you want. Dip out, out what you want. Yeah. Well, that's a new one on me. Anybody they, out there has got any uh, testimonies on that, we'd like to hear about that. Yeah. I, and I never heard this before, but they swear by it. And I know she, they ain't want to tell a story. Um, she said, you just put them in a pillar case. Put them in a uh, put them in the freezer, and then you just go get out what you want. Hmm. That'd we'll be interesting. Pests. So let's talk about pests real quick, because these things can get some pests. Now, this is one of those crops where uh, I think rotation is pretty important, especially if you've had some pest issues. If there's one downside to growing these peas, it's a pest problem. Yeah, and some places have a lot worse than other places do. Uh, I would say if you live in uh, the the uh, hot spot for commercial farming is going to be a little tougher on you. Um, 
there's several things that can can get them, but I'll go through the, the three big ones. First, you're going to have aphids. Um, that's the easy one to control. Aphids are pretty easy to control. You're going to use any kind of oil-based uh, insecticide is going to work on your aphids. The, the kind of catch-22 is here, you grow in these things in the hotter months of the year when you, you really don't want to be using oil-based insecticides. Uh, so if you are using something like our takedown or hoard oil, neem oil, be spraying that stuff late in the evenings. Um, Early in the mornings, late in the afternoons, either one. Um, so that will take care of the aphids. Also, your conventional pyrethroids. Mm -hmm. um, not pyrethrin, which is what uh, this is. Pyrethrins are organic. Pyrethroids are the synthetic version of those, and those will take them out as well. So synthetic pyrethroids were developed a few years ago, and they mimic the the same mode of action of pyrethrin, which we know is a organic compound that we use a lot of. And they mimic that same mode of action as far as killing the insect. The benefit to it is it lasts a lot longer. These pyrethrins that we love to use work great for knock down and killing the insect. They have no residual whatsoever. You gotta be regular about spraying. You gotta be regular, you gotta get coverage and whatever you get on it's gonna kill. Other than that, it's not gonna do any good. But these synthetic pyrethroids, and there's several of them out there, several different generations that were developed, they have a longer residual. Therefore, they kill, they do a lot better job at knocking down some of these pests because of the residual aspect of it. But it mimics has the same mode of action pretty much as, as the original pyrethrins did. Yeah, and as opposed to some things you might grow in your garden and you go out there and see some damage and you don't know what caused it, when you get aphids on your peas, you'll know it because they'll be on there thick as thieves. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll just be all over it. Right. Uh, it, it, it could happen fast. Yeah, and then you can control the aphids pretty easy with, because uh, you, you don't want to eliminate, you just want to knock them down below the damage threshold. You can do a pretty good job with uh, neem oil, pyrethrins, with some of the organic compounds knocking them aphids out. Now, we move to that next pest we're going to talk about. That's when you can run into some troubles. One more thing about the aphids. If you got a good ladybug population, they'll take care of that. I, I, I haven't intentionally done it, uh, or I don't know what I've done to do it, but I've noticed over the last few years I get more and more ladybugs out there, and I haven't had as much issues with, with aphids. Now, you can buy ladybugs online and turn them loose in your garden, but they are natural predator, and uh, they'll tear them up. Yeah, a lot of times you see wasps about in your garden. Wasps wasp are eating aphids too. Wasp. Wasp or wasp. Wasp. Uh, flying insects. The second, the, the big one, the big one is called P. curculio. Mm -hmm. and this is a weevil, and he's got a little snout like that, and he'll suck the life out of those pea pots. Sting them, and you'll see a little black spot in there where he has uh, stuck his nose in there and messed up your pea crop. Yep, he's done got a hold to them. Now, this is a tough one to control right here. Now, the, the regular way of controlling these is using some of these synthetic pyrethroids. Uh, one that we're going to be carrying later on this year is going to be called Bug Buster 2. And what's the active ingredient in it? Esfenvalerate. It's, I always have trouble with that. You guys out imagine. there that's in, been in the ag all your life, everything, Asana, it's the same active ingredient that's used in Asana. Now, uh, this will work on it pretty good. This is probably the best pesticide you can use on the Southern P. Curio, with the exception of one thing. I remember a few years ago, you decided you was gonna plant you a fall crop of uh, peas. And I told you, I said, boy, you wasting your time. They, they, they'll sting them up, you, you just gonna, you wasting your time. And you planted that fall crop, and you sprayed them maybe a couple times with neem, and you didn't have any of them stung up. And I've talked to several other people after that that had done the same thing. There seems to be a window of opportunity there with fall crop, and this is highly unusual because most of the time it's the other way around. We have higher insect pressure in the fall than we do in the springtime. But for some reason or other with peas, if you plant them at a certain time and get them into that window of the fall crop, you miss these generations of this curio, and you can grow a decent crop with not spraying them a whole lot. Maybe a couple applications of neem oil. Yeah. But it's weird. I'm telling you, I ain't got it figured out by no means. But I mean, you've noticed it, you have did it, and I've, I've talked to other people that had the same experience. So I think there's something to it. But I can tell you, growing them in the springtime, I don't know what it is, but you better have your plan of action or you're going to be eating up with some, some Southern Peaky Curio in your peas. 
Yeah, I'm hoping we we get some of that bug buster two in by the time I get my we peas, should my we peas should. going. Pe field peas. That's one of those things. If you ever gonna just kind of loosen up your personal uh, regulations on your organic spraying and, and use something synthetic, that is one of those things where a lot of people are like, "All right, I, I've had it. I'm about I'm about to G A T A." If you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah, and this is not. This is not a, a, a metoclopin or neo, 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 neo nicotoids. It's not none of that class chemistry that we don't like so much. So if you are going to stray away a little bit, this is the one to go with right here. Yeah, we and talking to customers with field bees, that's the one where they're like, okay, I, I got to, I got to put something synthetic on there. I think it, I had a look at labels either a seven or fourteen day retreat on it that you spray on a program. It's seven fourteen days, I forgot. Yeah, we we'll have yeah. to look at that and see. The last one is uh, you got aphids, you got the pea curculia, and the last one is root knot nematodes. These things can get nematodes, and a lot of times that happens just because your rotation. Mm -hmm. If you're planting these where you normally plant a lot of okra or tomatoes, you may have some issues with that. Not a whole lot you can do for nematodes. You can buy a fumigate with mustard. You can buy products that are nuclear soils. I don't think that's what you want to do. Uh, be a great idea to follow these with your mustard cover crop or follow that with a corn crop or a corn so crop it's good behind corn rotate 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 these with your okra and your tomatoes so you don't get those bad I tell you what be a good thing if you had your early crop of corn in there and when your corn got through you could come behind that and plant peas that might be a good little strategy to have have you some peas coming on later in the summertime show show would uh, we don't have any questions this week. Not a lot of questions from uh, Fredo's show. Uh, but if you want to be a part of the show, please put your questions in the comments there. We'll do and, our uh, best. So I want one more thing to mention before we head out while we're talking about pest issues. So this is some stuff right here we've had on the site for a while. And I have used it in the past, but I have kind of gotten away from using it. I don't know why in the last few years. Uh, so this is diatomaceous earth. This is a food grade formulation that can be used for lots of different things. You can actually drink this right here. Uh-huh. Do you know I've done that? Yep. Made me a milkshake one time. Yep. You take that in place. That's the reason, that reason all that stuff bounces off me. Sometimes I'll get me a swig of that right there. You might need to be getting you a swig over there. Right yeah. There. Make you a D. A lot of people call it D-E. That's short. D-E. Slang for yep. it. Make you a D-E milkshake. So DE is, or diatomaceous earth, is from diatoms. Diatoms are phytoplankton, mm -hmm. so they're little photosynthetic organisms. And when they fall, they have cell walls made of silica. When they fall to the floor of whatever body water they're in, it accumulates. And then we can get it like this right here. So the way this works as far as a pest control mechanism is you dust your soil or your plants with it. And when the plant, the insect or whatever ingests it, it dries them out real quick. Or when they crawl over it, it punctures their exoskeleton and it dries them out. Right. A lot of people use it, uh, it's more of a contact than it is an ingestion. <coughs> so anyway, <coughs> I was aware of the benefits and stuff. I'd just kind of gotten away from using it for whatever. I got some cabbage planted out there now. And I don't usually have a lot of issues on my traditional cabbage. But you know that Chinese cabbage is a little more tender. I can get eat up on that quick like, and I had some fast damage happening. I don't know if it was aphids or flea beetles, but it was one of the two. It wasn't worms. And so what I did is I went out there and I dusted the whole plant and around it with some of this stuff right here. And I'd be dog if it didn't nip it in the bud. I stopped getting damage almost uh, immediately after that happened. Now, I've, I've read that you can mix this and make a little slurry with it and mm -hmm. spray it. So it sticks to the plant. What I did was I used this, and then I came in a day or two later with some takedown, which has got oil in it, and that made everything stick. And I kind of nipped that product in the uh, nip that problem in the bud. I say that to say this for your squash. Bug, I'm going to use this uh, heavily to try to help out more squash bugs this year. I'm going to sprinkle this when those squash plants get up a little bit around the base there and uh, that's where them squash bugs hide out anyway and uh, hmm. put this down there and uh, try to take care of some bad boys a lot of people use it on chickens for mite problems it has yeah. worlds of applications i mean like i said get you 
this food grade, you can drink you a little bit every now and supposed to be good. Clean your innards out, get them parasites out of you. Yeah. And uh, I mean, if you want to look, I'm, I'm living proof of it. I mean, you want to look uh, healthy and you know, ten years got good you color, got good color, and all that. You may want to get you some drink. Now, I hadn't drank none in a long time, but I have drank some of it before. Yeah. Food grade, it's great, safe product. You can feel feel wonderful about using this around your house, especially if you got small children or pets Ants, or whatever. You can use this on ant beds, mm -hmm. um, on everything. I, I'm going to use a lot more of it this year, but just try to reduce the times I have to spray. Not that I have a problem with spraying, but just because I think it's going to be easier if I can sprinkle some of this and try to reduce some of my spraying application. Mm -hmm. So that that's my goal. Just figured I'd put that out there. Yeah, good deal. You, you, we might let you drink some on next week's might, show. Maybe. How about that? That'd be fine. I ain't scared. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed the field pea discussion. Don't forget to tell us what your favorite field pea variety is. And if you live up north and never tried field peas, you should definitely give them a try. They only take about 60 days to start making. So once things get good and hot, uh, you know, Yeah, 60, that Red Ripper is at 70. Uh, most of these 65 might say 70. days. Yeah. Depending on where you are, 60 to 70. You can grow them up north uh just a lot of people don't so give them a try great food source if you enjoyed tonight's video make sure to give us a big thumbs up don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already ring that bell so you get notified every time we come out with a new video and if you did enjoy it make sure to check out these other two videos right here maybe even some videos on field peas mm. we'll see you guys take care time.